In this video, I'll be breaking down the mental models from this book, The Great Mental Models, Volume 2, by Rhiannon and Bobian and Shane Parrish. And the best thing about these models are that you don't have to be a scientist or even understand scientific equations to use them. You see, while they are derived from science, these models apply broadly across business and relationships, and they're really just great tools for better navigating the world. Let's get started. How come two people looking at the same event often walk away with completely different accounts of what happened? This is something that we see all the time in criminal investigations, and in physics, this is called relativity. Relativity is the idea that there is no single fixed frame of reference. Things appear different based on where you're standing and how you're moving. Now, this idea was the foundation for Einstein's famous theory of relativity, but let's use a way simpler example to explain this. Let's imagine that you're driving down the highway, going 60 miles an hour. Hour. There's a car in the lane next to you, also going 60 miles an hour. As you look over at that car, it appears that it's barely moving in comparison to you because you're both driving down the road at around the same speed. But to a pedestrian standing on the sidewalk, it looks like you guys are flying by at 60 miles an hour. Same reality, different frame of reference. Let's try a more abstract example. Pretend that you're at a basketball game and a foul is called. To one team's fans, that foul may look clear as day, especially if it's not the team they're rooting for. Comparatively, the other team's fans would object and say, what was that? That was totally fair play. How could you call that a foul? Now everyone's watching the same game, but their loyalties shape their frame of reference. Now, just to be clear, relativity is not the same as relativism, which is the idea that all perspectives are equally valid. Some frames of reference bring us closer to reality than others. The science fiction author Isaac Asimov has a great question quote that goes something like this. When people thought the earth was flat, they were wrong. When people thought the earth was spherical, they were wrong. But if you think that thinking the earth is spherical is just as wrong as thinking the earth is flat, then you are wronger than both of them put together. Now, if this seems confusing, technically the earth is an oblate spheroid. It's slightly flatter at the poles and slightly bulging at the equator due to rotation. Basically, it's just a sphere with a little squish. So relativity reminds us that perspective shapes how we see the world. But once people start to interact, something even more powerful comes in, which is reciprocity. In nature and in human society, what we put out tends to come back to us, and a lot of times in ways we don't expect. All right, so reciprocity is the idea that actions create responses. In physics, this is often framed as Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In human behavior, this means that generosity and hostility both tend to echo back to their source. Think about rowing a boat. As you row, you're pushing the water backwards. The water pushes back against the oar. And because the oar is connected to the boat through you, through your hands, arms, and body, the backward push from the water gets transferred to the boat, pushing it forward. That's reciprocity in physics. Now this model applies in social situations too, which is where you're probably much more likely to recognize it. Let's say that a friend buys you coffee. You'll likely feel the urge to return the gesture next time you guys go out for coffee. Or let's say you're at the grocery store and they have free samples and you try some. This triggers our reciprocity instinct. People are much more likely to buy something after first receiving something. Now, the way to benefit from this model is super simple. It's basically pay it forward. You want to go positive and go first. If we accept that people are prone to reciprocating, then it makes sense to put our best foot forward. If you want an amazing relationship, try to become an amazing partner. If you want people to be thoughtful and kind to you, then start by being thoughtful and kind to them. If you want people to listen to you, start by listening to them. Reciprocity can be summed up like this. When you act on things, they tend to act back on you. But the universe doesn't always return this energy in perfect balance. Sometimes energy can get lost in the transfer. Think of this as kind of like nature's tax. Now this is where our next mental model comes in, thermodynamics. Why do clean and tidy rooms in our house naturally begin to get messy over time, but they never magically get clean over time? The answer is thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of energy, how it flows, how it changes forms, and how it's never fully preserved in a usable state. Now, the key idea for decision-making here is entropy. Entropy is basically a measure of randomness or chaos or disorder in a system. Now, the lesson here is that systems will naturally 
automatically move towards disorder unless additional energy is added in order to maintain them. Okay, here's an example from physics. Let's say that you have a hot cup of coffee that you put down on the counter. The heat energy from that coffee doesn't just disappear as the coffee cools down. The heat energy is actually expanding and dispersing into the room, but you can't easily get that heat energy back into the coffee. It's dispersed across trillions of air molecules. That is a disordered state, which means that the energy is no longer concentrated and very difficult to use. The physicist Helen Chersky has a brilliant quote on this. She says, the physical world, all of it, only ever has one destination, equilibrium. And so much of thermodynamics is about equilibrium. When two systems of temperatures get exposed to each other, they eventually become the same temperature. Jeff Bezos has talked extensively about equilibrium in the context of business and life, specifically warning against them. And in his final shareholder letter as Amazon CEO, he quotes the blind watchmaker by Richard Dawkins. The world wants you to be typical. In a thousand ways, it pulls at you. Don't let it happen. And what he's trying to convey here is that living things must work continuously to avoid merging into their environment, to resist equilibrium. And while this is off topic, I have to mention it. Jeff Bezos in his shareholder letters drops some absolute gold nuggets. I'm kind of digging through them right now. I would highly recommend it. Essentially, thermodynamics shows us the cost of standing still. Energy leaks out unless we actively put more in. Our next mental model, inertia, shows us the flip side how hard it actually is to get things moving in the first place. Why is it so hard to start something new? But once you're in motion, it feels so much easier to keep going. The answer is inertia, which is the tendency in objects and in people to resist changes in motion. When something is at rest, it stays at rest. When something is in motion, it stays in motion, unless something forces it to stop. Imagine a boulder sitting on the ground. It won't move unless a force is acted upon it, like gravity or maybe you pushing it. If you tried rolling that boulder, it would require a tremendous amount of force at first. But once you get that initial motion, it would be a lot easier to keep it in motion. That's inertia. Now think about smoking cigarettes. For decades, cigarettes were marketed as glamorous or even healthy. By the 1950s, evidence was piling up that smoking clearly caused cancer, but people didn't stop. Not only were people addicted, but society as a whole had just been in motion for so long. Billions of advertising dollars, even government tax revenue, was pushing this system to keep rolling forward. Even once the science was generally accepted, it took generations of lawsuits and public health campaigns to even slow it down. And I'm just talking about the United States. Inertia shows us why it's so hard to get moving and so hard to stop once you have momentum. But even momentum can face resistance. In the physical world, World, that resistance shows up as friction and viscosity. Friction is the resistance that shows up when two objects rub against each other, and it directly opposes motion. Viscosity is resistance within the medium itself. It often describes the thickness of a liquid and how that thickness slows down its movement. Both friction and viscosity consume energy, meaning they make movement less efficient. Imagine sliding a heavy box across a floor. The rougher the surface of that floor, the harder it is to push the box. If you've ever been to Walmart, you'll notice that the floors are very smooth, allowing for little friction between the wheels of the shopping cart and the floor itself. This makes it a lot easier to push a heavy shopping cart around the store. Now let's contrast that with the deck of a boat, which is a lot more like sandpaper, a high friction surface. And it's designed that way on purpose so that when it gets wet, you don't slip. You see, the higher the friction, the more energy is required to move the object. You may notice this energy because a lot of it is transferred through heat and sound. This is why it would be generally impolite to rearrange your furniture in the middle of the night. Furniture tends to be a pretty high friction object, otherwise it would be sliding around your apartment all the time. Now let's talk about viscosity. Imagine that you're stirring a spoon through a glass of water. The liquid parts pretty easily, and the spoon moves with little resistance. Now try the same thing with a jar of honey. It sticks to the spoon, drags against it, and really resists movement. That's viscosity, the thickness of the liquid itself. It doesn't stop you outright, but it slows you down and it requires more energy to move. Now friction in business looks like endless approval chains, regulations, and paperwork. These things reduce your ability to move forward. 
Now, I'm not saying that those things are bad, rather that they objectively prevent you from just moving forward. In fact, that's usually why they're there, to intentionally slow you down. Viscosity, as previously seen in a flow of liquid, can also be viewed in a flow of information. When information has to pass through too many hands, or when departments are siloed off away from one another, information moves a lot slower, a lot more inefficiently, and a lot of energy is wasted in that transfer. Now, the thicker that flow of information, the greater the drag on innovation and on progress. At Tesla, engineers and designers were originally kept in separate buildings. Ideas had to crawl through meetings and layers of email. Elon Musk's solution to this was brutal in its simplicity. Move the designers to be right next to the engineers. Suddenly, feedback was instant. If a design didn't work, the engineer could turn to the designer and say, why the hell did you design it this way? That single change thinned the viscosity of the flow of information. Now, information flowed fast. Friction and viscosity show us why movement slows and how energy gets wasted. But once you strip that resistance away, you can focus on velocity. Not just movement, but movement with both speed and direction. That's our next model. If a man does not know to what port he is steering, no wind is favorable to him. Seneca. Most people, myself included, assumed that speed and velocity are the same thing, but that's not true. Velocity is speed and direction. Okay, let's go back to our car example with the car driving 60 miles an hour. If the car is ever so slightly turned in one direction, it's really just going in a big circle. It's gonna end up right back where it started. But a car driving 60 miles an hour going straight has both speed and direction. In other words, it's actually going somewhere. Now in life, and particularly in business, speed without direction looks like busy work. You're doing a lot of stuff, but you're not really making any progress. For example, cranking out emails all morning might feel great and productive, like we're doing something, but making three key decisions a day that advance your business towards a stated mission or goal is more reflective of true velocity and not just activity. You see, progress can only be measured in relation to a clearly defined destination. Once you have a destination, you can improve your velocity by working specifically on things that are aligned with that goal, and by eliminating things that don't directly contribute to that goal. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand, and I will move the world. God, I love that quote. Leverage is when you achieve an output that's significantly greater than the amount of force you put in. It is the force multiplier of the world, allowing the small to move the large and the few to move the many. Think of a crowbar. With the same strength, you can pry open something that would be impossible with your bare hands. The lever doesn't give you a fixed additional amount of strength, but multiplies what you already have. So many human tools incorporate leverage, from scissors to pliers to wheelbarrows to fishing rods. But there are also newer, softer forms of leverage. Media is leverage. A single video like this one, or a podcast, or an article, can be spread to millions of people with the same amount of force it would take to share it with one person. You hit record once, publish once, and now that piece of media can be finding new viewers while you sleep. That's like the modern equivalent of Archimedes' lever. Scalable, permissionless force. Anyways, thank you so much for watching this video. If you made it this far, then you'll be pleased to know that I have another one just like it on the first book in this series. It's actually the most popular video on the channel with over 250,000 views. So if you're one of those 250,000, sincerely, thank you. And if you haven't seen the video yet, then check it out. I'll see you over there.